What's going on, guys? Sensible Prepper Live. And we're going to have Robbie Wheaton show up in a few minutes. He's running a little bit late, and I told him to just come on. So when he does, we'll just join in. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about the 12 worst newbie mistakes for preppers. Now, let me just say this up front. This really applies to us all. Uh, a lot of times, you know, we could be doing prepping for a long time, and these are some areas that you just might overlook, you might be doing. And so it's going to give you some, uh, just some tips and pointers to kind of shore up your preps, get yourself more organized, get yourself more focused. Uh, that's probably the biggest thing. Uh, but before we get started, uh, I want to give a big thank you to Sarah Mack. She's over on the computer monitoring the questions and comments. And if you have something uh, that you want to ask, you can ask it at any time and we'll take a break and she can go to some questions. Um, also, we really appreciate Exotac, some of the best fire starting tools and implements out there. Uh, they're made down in Winder, Georgia. I mean, it's between ferro rods, lighters, match holders, strikers, all kind of different tools. And uh, they give a 20% discount using Such20 with the link down below in the description. And we appreciate Exotac for offering that. Uh, having a fire kit, guys, is, is vital to survival. Uh, it cooks your food. It boils your water. It gives you light. gives you warmth. It can keep predators at bay. It gives you a good morale. And so having a fire kit and redundancy in your fire tools is important. All right. We're going to talk about these 12 areas, these 12 mistakes. Again, guys, it's one of those things that even a very seasoned prepper can fall into. And let's face it, guys, we're we're preparing for an unknown. We're preparing for something that maybe has never been seen, definitely in our lifetime, uh, but has been seen around the world of mistakes and civilizations have completely collapsed. So we're not immune to it. Um, you know, it's just like, and we'll talk about this in a minute, just like this eclipse that was happening and everybody got all, you know, stirred up about it. Um, and guys, having yourself prepared in a good way, you don't have to go nuts, but just doing some things to get yourself ahead is just smart, but also it can be very overwhelming. Uh, there's so many different possibilities. And so you can't do it all, but whatever you do on a daily or weekly basis puts you that far ahead of where you were before. It's not a race. It's something that we do on a regular basis. Uh, and honestly, right now, and I've said this with the price of gold up to twenty three hundred and sixty dollars today, uh, it's kind of back down to two thousand three hundred and fifty dollars uh, is unprecedented and it's historical. We've never been anywhere near that amount. So while things kind of kind of hum along, there are some indicators, indicators, concrete indicators. Uh, that we're not heading in a good direction. So with that being said, we're not here to uh, doom and gloom everybody and get everybody depressed. We're here that you will be better prepared in a bad situation. You can, you can ramp that up how you want to. Okay, the first thing, number one mistake for preppers, especially new preppers, is talking too much. Just talking about it. You know, you see your friends, you're talking about the way things are going, you're talking about the price of gold, you're talking about the immigrants pouring across the border and how crime has spiked. And, you know, there's there's so many different the, the mess going on in, the, in Russia and, and you're just talking about it and you're saying we've been putting back food. We've been doing this. The best thing to do, uh, and even if you've already done it, is to back off and to keep your thoughts to yourself, not necessarily talking about the things that are happening in the world. But you storing up food, you putting things together, because here's the thing. World War II, one of the big sayings was loose lips sink ships. You are going to become a target. It may be something in passing where they don't even think about it at the time. Maybe they think you're a little bit off, but they're not really thinking about it. Later on down the road, they will remember. Uh, you know, it's like that when you when you're looking for something and you see it and then a month later, you need that. And you're going, wait a minute, where did I see that? Oh, yeah, I saw that at Home Depot. It's the same thing. They're going to relate you to having supplies to help them, whether they've done anything or not. And you become a target. Uh, in your neighborhood, you definitely become a target. Uh, 
uh, you know, people know that you're a prepper. If you're talking, you're, you've got chickens and you, you know, you've got solar and you've got all this stuff going on around your house and, and people start to notice those things. Uh, and so it's best to be subdued. It's best to just kind of keep it on the down low. Uh, save it for those that you're going to be working with. And that's the big thing. Uh, for us, we have a prepper group. We do our talking. Of course, I do my talking here to you. Uh, honestly, if it wasn't for YouTube and it wasn't for my mission to help you get prepared, I wouldn't talk about it. Nobody would know it. So the big thing is, is to keep your mouth quiet. Listen, when you are in the middle of prepping and you're building up supplies and you're, you're doing things, that's your focus. I mean, that's what you, it's just like it wants to come out naturally, but you've got to fight the urge and you've got to keep it to yourself. Again, talking about current events and helping people to kind of say, you know, man, maybe I ought to do something is one thing. But being obsessed with it and talking about preps and talking to your blue in the face uh, is going to cause you problems later on. Uh, one of the things also that's a, a byproduct is that if, let's say you and your spouse, your spouse not really on board. The more you try to convince them that they need to be prepping typically drives them away. Uh, the best thing to do is just to quietly prepare where you can. They may notice some things. They may see some stuff, but you're not trying to talk them into it. And that's one of the big problems that we've seen over the years is people saying, hey, my spouse won't get on board. It's because you're talking about it too much. You're just overdoing it to where they don't they can't even handle all that. Uh, and so what really was a cure for that is that we had uh, when we formed our prepper group, some of the ladies, because a lot of times it is ladies, but sometimes it is the husband as well, that they kind of got together and started talking about it. And then it made sense to those wives to where they started picking up on it. Uh, and so let others help you do something to bring your spouse into the fold. Uh, if it's a husband, you want somebody that you know that is a prepper that can talk to him on a one and one and somebody that maybe he respects. So give that, just keep your lips sealed like the old go-go song. <laughs> My lips are sealed and put your stuff together. The thing is you don't want all your family, all your friends and everybody else showing up at your place uh, because they know you have a little more food than they do. Your preps are designed to protect you and your family. And so you need to keep that in mind. And that is the number number one thing, because a lot of times we, we're new, we get kind of rolling and we start talking about it. Um, OK, number two. And this is a big one, guys. We live in an information age that's unparalleled uh, with the Internet, with social media, with all the different news outlets from the extreme right to the extreme left. And one thing you really need to be careful of either side is that they can do things and say things that are very sensationalized. Um, I'll never forget when I first started my YouTube channel, it's been 16 years ago and a girl got in touch with me and she said, I just saw a video. It said, if you don't have your preps together now, that it's too late. That was 16 years ago. Prepping is, again, not a race. It's something that you do and you incorporate and you build up your supplies. If you see things really going south in a physical way where you're like, you know, we really need to kind of think this through, then step it up um, and be diligent. If you're diligent and you're picking up extra items, guys, if you go to the grocery store and, and there's you just say, hey, you know what? I've got a few extra dollars. I'm going to buy some beans and rice. Then do that. And that'll just put you a little bit ahead and just try to do that on a regular basis. And before long, it'll build up. So take but take everything with a grain of salt, because the problem is, is a lot of times people are saying like the eclipse. Perfect example. Uh, there were a ton of people talking about, oh, this is the end of the world. Oh, there's all these cities lined up named Nineveh and, and then, which wasn't even true. And then they began to get excited and, and started talking about all the, the conspiracies that were going on all around us. So Robbie's here. So I'm going to move over and let him join us. Robbie, great to see you. Well, you know, if you can't get here on time, you just get here when you can. <laughs> <laughs> and we're here. We're here and we're ready. But, you know, Robbie's our entertainment factor, yeah. so we need Robbie here. I'm glad to be here today. Robbie from Wheaton Arms, um, also the Robbie Wheaton YouTube channel. 
and uh, check it out. We have a link down below in the description. He was a gunsmith for over 20 years in the U.S. Marine Corps. Uh, just an all-around good guy. Boy Scout for big kids. Boy Scout for big kids. And um, are you doing a live tonight? Live tonight at 6 p.m. Eastern. Live tonight at 6 p.m. Check it out. Uh, it will be, again, the link will be down below in the description. So what we're talking about now is all the information. We're on number two. Mm -hmm. All the information that's coming in and how we can get sidetracked. Um, and you can't believe everything. Don't believe everything you're hearing. Again, the apocalypse. I mean, the uh, the eclipse. Well, the apocalypse. <laughs> the apocalypse. <laughs> uh, you know, it was one of those things where a lot of people really uh, got just strung out on. I mean, they mm -hmm. were just all upset. I saw many videos saying, well, what, what about this? Have you seen this? This is something to think about. Y2K? Yeah, Y2K. <laughs> you know, anything that you get just overwhelmed with. Yeah. Um, and and you got to be careful that you don't get sucked in. I had a, mm -hmm. a nephew that uh, he called my my brother-in-law because my brother-in-law is a pastor. And so he called him saying this eclipse. And he was at three in the morning, all upset, mm -hmm. freaking out, you know? Uh, and we were talking about it yesterday at lunch uh, before it happened. And there was some talk about it at lunch, we, you know, where it's about well, the kids were sitting around and my wife. And um, I just started laughing. I said, guys, you know, you can't get wrapped up mm -hmm. in every little thing that happens. Look at the things that are happening or sometimes there's something just like we talked about one time they had when we had our, our gas pipeline that was hacked and we had all these, um, you know, they, they were, they were going to shut down the Eastern seaboard pretty much. And I went to get gas and nobody was even doing anything. Mm -hmm. So it until a couple of days later uh, and then everything went nuts. But the thing is, is when you do hear something credible, then act on it. But don't get freaked out on it. It's like wives' tales, conspiracies. It kind of gets the rumor mill going. I tell you, <laughs> one of the biggest things that I've seen lately has been uh, flat Earth and the eclipse <laughs> with the flat Earth and everything. It, and this one guy actually brought up a really good point that that really made me think about it. And uh, he was talking about airplanes. You know, airplanes fly off of a. Um, uh, altimeter and an altimeter is is basically a level right well, if you hold a level up in the air it's always flat if you hold it put it on something that's flat it's flat right well an airplane flies off of an altimeter which is always flat so if the earth is round how does the plane stay straight gravity <laughs> i'm not a flat earther <laughs> Uh, I'm not. Maybe. maybe. Uh, no, I'm not. I'm not. But it's it's one of those things that really makes you think, you know. And I like thought provoking questions. Yeah. And that was that was a really good one that I was like, hmm. So I'm going to take this one with a grain of salt. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. You know, one of the things too. I mean, seriously, uh, all things aside, is if you're not careful, then you start to discredit everything. Mm. Yeah. And that is one problem. Uh, if you're if you're discrediting everything, uh, you know, because we do, we get so much information. It's kind of like the boy that cried wolf. And when you start getting a lot of that information, then you just start dismissing things. Mm -hmm. So it's important. And I think that's what happened with that gas shortage. Yep. The uh, a lot of people said, oh, yeah, whatever, whatever. And then all of a sudden the gas stations were out of gas. Um, and so taking and finding credible information, making sure that you're you know, you're watching things. I know right now with. Um, with everything that's going on with the economy, uh, prices are skyrocketing food prices. I mean, we're, and, and we can see it in real time. We're mm -hmm. going to have lunch and it's a hundred bucks, which it used to be 50. I mean, price, food prices have gone up 50% or 40% at least. And then you go to the grocery. So, you know, those are things that you really need to go. You know what? This is a credible threat. Whether the solar eclipse turns into the second coming of Christ, you know, would be a plus, honestly, you know, but um, but the thing is, is don't get wrapped up in these these wives tales. And I say that affectionately to women because, you know, it's just one of those things. But men are just as bad and we all know it. We so, don't gossip. Yeah. <laughs> what do you think we're doing right now? <laughs> but it's information overload. Yep. And you've got to be able to pick and choose. You've got to take the right and wise decisions <clears throat> and not let everything drive you crazy. And but, do your own research. Yes. You know, that, 
if something, you know, like the, the whole airplane deal, you know, do your own research on it. Don't, don't just take someone's opinion on something as fact. Do your own research and prove it out one way or the other. Right, right. So, again, take everything with a grain of salt, filter out the things that are not important, and you'll just be in a better position. Okay, number three is buying cheap, buying junk. Uh, when when I was, and because here's the thing, guys, when you're getting into prepping, you're like, I've got to have stuff. Mm -hmm. And I don't really have a whole lot of money, so I'm just going to buy what I can. Hey, that that knife is 12 bucks. Yep. So I'm going to get out. two of them. Yeah. <laughs> you got two pieces of junk. <laughs> uh, you know, it's funny. There are some items out there that are inexpensive. And while they, the price seems cheap, they're actually pretty decent. It was funny. I did a review on a charade knife. It was a, they had just come out with a bunch of powder coats and all this stuff with G10 scales, but they were very cheap, very mm -hmm. reasonable. Yep. And uh, a guy that owned a knife company had sent me a couple of them to test. And they went through the test beautifully. Yeah. I mean, I was <clears throat> poking it through barrel top, metal barrels, you know, doing all kind of, of, of a torture test on those knives. And they worked fine. So there are some good things out there, but let me just say that when, when we had a, uh, one time our prepper group, we had a bug out night and we all met and we were going to meet in a certain parking lot and everybody was going to have like their bug out setups and we were going to kind of go through. Uh, in fact, Scott Hunt from engineer 775, um, skinny medic Dietrich was there. I mean, we had a number of people there too, that, that were actually, you know, really solid in prepping. And uh, it was funny. We would open up some of the bags and they still had the plastic cheap wrapping mm -hmm. around like a compass, cheap, cheap compass and a knife and a multi-tool that was like six bucks. It's better to buy a few quality items than to buy a lot of junk, a lot of poor quality, a lot of things that will break easily. Uh, you take a good solid knife, it's going to last you a lifetime. You Several buy, lifetimes. Yeah. 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 Now, one, one difference is like the Mora knives, great knives. They run about 10 bucks a piece. Yeah. And they've been <clears throat> used. That's a big prepper item that a lot of people like. And I have a bunch of them. Uh, they're just great utility knives. They're not like fighting knives or anything, but they're good, solid knives that you can use for different purposes. So, Again, like Robbie said, do your research. Yep. Hey, you know, one big thing, especially with knives, and I'm really glad that you were talking about those, is it doesn't matter what the quality of the knife is. It doesn't matter how much you paid for it. If you're using it for something that it was not intended for, you can break it. You know, I, I snapped a really, really good knife a couple of months ago racing with, with my son, and uh, he, he'd been apart on his cart. And a knife was all that I had in my pocket to be able to straighten the part out. And I jammed it in there and straightened the part out and snapped the blade on it. Oh, and right. uh, it was a, it was a really good, really high quality, high end knife. And uh, I destroyed it. Right. Using it for something that it was never intended to be used for. So, you know, getting the right tool for the job and using the right tool for the job is just as important as buying quality tools. You know, one thing I've noticed too is, and even with expensive stuff, uh, knives that are that are nice, expensive knives, is that if you're not careful, you don't you baby them. You don't want to use them. Mm -hmm. you, you know, you're careful with them. The Safe uh, Queen gun. Yes, yeah, mm -hmm. a Safe Queen. Uh, you want to use what you have. I mean, I've got a Microtech. L, uh, it's one of the out the sides, and uh, it's I think it's the LUDT. Uh, Great knife, solid, expensive. This thing is beat to heck because I use it. But the thing is, is a good knife is worth its value, worth its weight in gold. So use it. And then I know how it works. Uh, but, you know, like if you take a Swiss Army knife, which mm -hmm. is a great knife. Yep. Yep. They got thin blades. Mm -hmm. If you take it and do what Robbie did, it's going to snap yep. because it's not made for that. Uh, prying and doing things. So, Finding something that's good, you don't have to you don't have to go out and buy the most expensive thing out there because again, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're even going to last. That's right. But buying something that is good quality, but you don't want to overspend because you need those funds to be able to purchase other items on your list. And a lot of times, guys will get all myopic, and that's actually one of the things we're going to look at in a minute. But they get so myopic on this one knife, 
And that knife can cost six, seven hundred dollars, mm-hmm. which is absolutely insane to pay that kind of money for. Unless you're a knife guy and you and you just love that and you collect them, that's fine. But for a normal, just average individual to go out and spend as much money or three or four hundred dollars on a knife uh, and then tuck it away and never use it is, is ridiculous. So you can use that toward building up your food preps, your water, whatever, whatever you have next. So. Go ahead. And, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of if I'm researching a product that I'm looking at buying, I look at online reviews from multiple different sources on that product. And I don't just look at the one stars. I don't just look at the five stars. I look at the three and four star reviews because yeah. those are generally the honest review that somebody has bought that item. They've used that item and they're giving you their honest opinion about it. They're just not going in there and clicking on a five star or going in there and they got a lemon and they're clicking on a one star. They're, they're giving you a good, honest review of that product. So I use online reviews a lot when I'm looking at buying new products to, to kind of weed out something that I may or may not end up purchasing. Right. And just because the price is lower doesn't mean that it's not a really good item. That's which right. We've done that quite a <clears throat> bit where I bought medium priced items or mm-hmm. even lower price, but yet they have, they tend to hold up very well. Well, flashlights are a big one with that, huh? Yeah. Well, flashlights, you know, you, you got to be careful because a lot of times you go into Home Depot or Lowe's and they got mm-hmm. some lights there and you get yep. one, you know, and, and it's just, it, it may hold up. It may not. And sometimes you find stuff. I found them at Walmart before. They were actually decent little flashlights. Um, not really anything high lumens or, but sometimes the battery runs out really fast. Right. That's one of the <clears> problems. Uh, or it takes D cell batteries and it weighs a ton. <laughs> so buy, not buying junk, but it's really funny because in the book. Um, and this is a great book, especially if you're a newbie, but even if you're a seasoned prepper is the modern survival guide for the coming economic collapse, which was about, uh, the economic, um, burst in Argentina, uh, where they had a massive economic meltdown. And one of the things that for foul who wrote that book, uh, he wrote about all the different real life events that happened. And that's really where this is important. Uh, because Argentina was not, is not a third world country. It was a first world country. And uh, because of, of their practices, they went. But the problem was, is the peso went to zero and crime went through the roof. And but one of the things he did was he had a Rambo. He said, all I had was a Rambo survival knife, the one with the, you know, the top and the items inside the, you know, the fishing kit and the compass and all that. And he said that knife served me all through that or- ordeal. He goes, I didn't, I didn't realize it. He probably didn't use it to pry something, you know, to break it. But he said, I used it. And so sometimes there are some things you've got what you have. And so use it. But one of the things about that is a knife is a very important tool. It's one of the most important tools you'll have. And so make sure that you buy a decent quality knife, not cheap. Okay. This is kind of parallels with this, but it's a little different is novelties, new gadgets, things that are cool. Um, you know, I had this one thing and I'm not di- uh, dissing it, but it was a survival shovel and it came in all these different sections. Mm-hmm. Very well made, actually. Had a shovel and you take this part off, it has a knife and has a compass on the end and it had places to put things. And, and it was actually kind of cool. It was expensive. It was really expensive. But, you know, I got it for review and took it out and tested it and it was fine. But then I've got this huge pack thing and I've got to put it all together. And it's just when I could have had just a small little pack shovel and a knife and done pretty much everything that did. Uh, So be careful, even if it's high quality, even if it's something really cool, this is so freaking cool. (laughs) And there's a time for that, you know, if you have some of your other preps set aside. Mm -hmm. But be careful not to get lured by the shiny things, the things that are out there that are shiny. If you don't have just a good, solid, basic EDC, you know, your knife, your flashlight, your uh, multi-tools, just just some things that have been tried and true, the newfangled um, novelties. This is something cool that's just come out. Uh, you know, it may have a lot of electronics with it. It may have a lot of things that yep. just, <clears throat> and, you know, I kind of look at items like that, like with uh, new medicines that come out, you know, and until it's been on the market for, seven to 10 years and is really proven. That's a good point. I tend to stay away from it. Right. Yeah. If it's really that valuable and really that useful and innovative, it will remain for a while. That's right. 
Uh, don't go to Pinterest because you'll see about 30,000 <laughs> different cool and intriguing type items. And you'll be like, oh, man, that's cool. Oh, that's really neat. And before long, you've just got a drawer full of junk mm -hmm. because you, you're not even using it. That is money that's wasted on things that are honestly very usable. Let's face it, a standard knife. There's not really a substitute. You can have all kind of a knife with a flashlight attached. And I've got some kits and things with that kind of stuff. And it's just that knife is almost impossible to use. Right. And even if you do, it's going to break. So well, it's like the 172 item Swiss Army knife. You know, <laughs> it's it's super cool, but it's it's huge and almost unusable because you you can't get to anything on it that you actually need. <laughs> but if you need a corkscrew, dead gum, it's there. Um uh, and, you know, that's fine. Uh, you know, the funny thing is we were at Smoky Mountain Knife Works this past weekend. Me too. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and um, we, uh, you know, you look through and there's tons of gadgets and stuff, you know, all kind of things. Um, but, you know, if you're not careful, you get sidetracked <clears throat> on stuff and you need to kind of focus because the knife is really, there's no substitute for it. Uh, especially, you know, it's like the uh, uh, jack of all trades, master of none. Mm. Now, that statement really was not a blasting jack of all trades. It was like a jack of all trades is very versatile. Yep. And so there is some versatility that you need in the knife shape and the materials and things like that. But again, I love, I love what Robbie said. If it hasn't been around or it doesn't stay around for a long time, it's just a novelty. And that just means it's going to pass away because people loved it, but they just didn't really, they found themselves not using it. Okay, we're going to go to this next one. Then we're going to go to some questions. Uh, so we'll just jump in. Uh, losing track of your survival priorities. Mm -hmm. uh, th this is one thing that happens with a lot of preppers is they get real heavy on guns, ammo, uh, their bug out bag, their, you know, whatever's just sexy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm going to conquer the world. They come to me <laughs> and I'm taking them out, you know, and you lose, you lose priorities on medical. And I'm not talking about having your trauma kit. Well, I got my trauma kit. I'm talking about everyday medical. I don't know how many times you're going to use a trauma kit daily, but you could be using a medical bag mm -hmm. full of gear that you're going to need, like antibiotic ointment or emodium or different things, making sure that you have your medical lined out. Secondly, if you're going to carry a trauma kit, make sure that you have trained with it, uh, which is getting into our next one. But um, water. Water something. You can only live three days without water. You need a gallon of water minimum per day per person. So having your water sources figured out and you may say, well, you know, I've got my water bottles stacked to the ceiling. Well, OK, that's good. That's good. Uh, but how are you going to continue on with your next step? You know, the thing is, there is a an initial, let's say, three months or let's say three weeks, you've got, you know, hey, this is what I'm doing. I've got three weeks. That'll give you some time. But when it comes to a long term, once you get that done, then move to the next phase, which means how am I going to get my water that's not at the store? What if the stores are out of water? How am I going to get my medical supplies? You know, what have I got stocked up? One good thing about medical supplies typically is hopefully you're not using them on a daily basis. Right. <laughs> you know, I think water is one of those that a lot of us really tend to take for granted because it is so readily available. You know, you, you walk through your house, you turn on a faucet, you get water. It's, it's there. You're like, why should I worry about water? But water is one of those things that is very easily contaminated and could very easily be taken out of the equation for you almost immediately. You know, if you travel out of the United States, almost anywhere, one of the first things you're told is don't drink the water with tap water, whatever. You don't drink it. You don't brush your teeth with it. You don't use it for anything that you're ingesting into your body because it's contaminated and will make you sick. And we take that for granted here because we do have clean water in the United States. And But water is one of those things that because we do take it for granted so much, we really need to make it a focus and a priority for our preps. I, I think water should be your number one prep over everything else. Because if, if you don't have reliable water and a reliable water source, like I said, you've got three days. Right. And, and that's it. You're done. 
you can live without a gun. You can live without a knife. You can live without all the cool prepping stuff that we have. And everybody loves the cool prepping stuff that we all have. You can live without food for a month. But water, you know, just a few days and you're you're a goner. Right. And and really, it's not a, a bad solution to, uh, as far as treating water. If you have a water yep. source, you know, you can boil the water. It doesn't remove the sediment or the smell, but you can boil it. Or you can have uh, bleach mm -hmm. and you can put the bleach in the water. Again, it doesn't take away the smell or the, in fact, it probably adds a but little bit. But it will bit. definitely mask it. Yeah, yeah, definitely <laughs> mask it. So, you know, having a few things, it doesn't have to be a distillery or some kind mm -hmm. of, you know, whatever, uh, and, you know, that you can filter and keep your water clean. But that's not the fun part. And so you got to be careful not to be too focused on the fun part that's right and too heavy on ammunition and it's like with covid you know people went nuts over guns and ammunition well i mean well there was some civil unrest that had gone on a little bit but that to day to day that didn't make a hill of beans i could have had the same gun that i've had forever just a good you could have had a good shotgun and you'd have been in good shape that's right let's see you could pop a squat with a 50 round box and nine millimeter you know <laughs> i'm just saying <laughs> or having toilet paper <laughs> put back which we found out that's a priority okay let's go to some questions and we're going to continue on uh jan asked south dakota watching how come all prep people seem to be from other states <laughs> that's because a lot of the people in South Dakota are natural preppers because they typically live out. I'm just, I'm making a generalization there, but uh, you know, it's according to what area you're living in. I mean, for us, we're, we're surrounded by a lot of people. There's less resources. Mm -hmm. You move out West and people live a little bit closer to the land, uh, you know, in the Midwest, especially in the Northwest, but um, a little, little bit closer to the land. So they're just naturally prepping. My grandparents uh, who live not too far from here, I had a nice spread and, you know, I didn't realize it at the time, but they were natural preppers. Mm -hmm. They grew their gardens. They had cattle. Uh, they, um, you know, kept their tin full fold folded because they were during the Great Depression. And so they were very frugal with their supplies and they weren't wasteful. Uh, but yet they had quite a bit of money. They weren't out just blowing it. They were they were doing, um, you know, the, the right things. Uh, but we have gotten so far away from that in today's society to where everything is disposable. That's so right. the problem is, is we're, we're losing our, our connection with nature and really what man has been doing since the beginning is, you know, just surviving. Yep. <clears throat> I couldn't agree more. Uh, Alan B asked, what do you think about GMRS radio? Great radios, but they're limited, typically line of sight. Um, and two, I mean, if it's encrypted, I think this is the really, I think the where it really shines, GM, GMRS radios or, or even just like walkie talkies or um, uh, the different type standard radios uh, are that you have, uh, especially in a, a security situation, it's better than a phone, better to have a setup so you can talk to each other. Uh, you want to be careful that you're not on a open line to everybody else that might have one. Uh, we were on a ship, a cruise ship a while back, and you couldn't even get on the radio because everybody brought their little radios and yeah. everybody was talking on them. So, you know, but um, I think they're great. They have a purpose, but I don't think that they're optimal, especially for longer ranges. Uh, typically, again, their line of sight, it may say 14 miles, but it's not going to reach that. You know, one of the big things, uh, my oldest son, he works a lot of wildfires and stuff and uh, just got home from one this past weekend, they were using GMRS on the, uh, the wildfire that he was on. The problem they were running into was it was a lot of mountainous terrain, a lot of hilly terrain, and it was blocking the radio signals. So they were having to, they were having to post repeaters or post individuals on mountaintops uh, so they could bounce the signal out and use individuals as repeaters to pass a signal along, pass a, a message along. That's interesting. Yep. But I do think there's a good place for it. I would highly recommend you having some. But I think that as far as longer range communications, it's going to have a lot of limitations, just like CB will. Yep. Uh, really, you need to go to ham. One thing that we're getting ready to do is to get satellite radios. Uh, satellite and, phones. So, thank you. You're Good welcome. God. Why do I have to do that? <laughs> uh, satellite phones. And, um, you know, we could have satellite radio in our car. You could. you could. I've done hey, this every yep. I've done this twice now. <laughs> Uh, but satellite phones, uh, you know, the uh, app, the uh, the radio signal is it's a, it, it's a monthly fee. It's not cheap. They're not cheap. But you got to decide, is this a viable option for communication? Is it worth it? 
So instead of going out and buying the six hundred dollar knife, I'm going to get my you know my my radio. Well, you know, I really think you know as as far along as we are with our preps, there there are certain things that we can look at that are that may not be an option for other people because we have been prepping for so long and and our preps are very solid in majority of areas where communication is one of those areas where we can expand our preps now. And, and I think for us, something like that is a great option because we, we are solid in a lot of our other preps. Right. And the satellites that pick up the satellite uh, phones are 450 miles above the atmosphere. Uh, I think that, um, a lot of the other type community GPS is only 250 miles above mm-hmm. the atmosphere. So uh, there's a lot of, uh, especially like for an EMP or something like that, you know, it, it's kind of been one of those things we've kind of settled on. Uh, so, but again, it is more expensive. Now we've gotten into a lot of that. <laughs> uh, Robert Rummer asked question. If I have already bought some junk, would it be bad form to pass it on to someone just starting their prepping journey? I think that'd be an excellent idea. Yep. Um, Travis, how you doing, man? Uh, I think that one of the things that um, that a lot of I've heard a lot of guys talk about it. They said, you know, I just buy junk knives, and I just buy them, and that way I can hand them out. I can do whatever. And and when I say junk knives, you can go to a store and they they have the little cheap knives. Sometimes they'll do pretty decently for certain tasks, and it's better to have that than nothing. I think that's a great idea. One thing that I did a few couple of years ago was I did small little bags of survival items to give out. Mm -hmm. So if you have people coming up a group or whatever, you can say, Hey, look, I got this extra knife and a fire starter and some things and you give it to them and it gets them started. And that could mean the difference between life and death. Uh, You know, just because you're not building an outdoor shelter and you need a certain kind of knife, they just may need to cut things and just not have that means. Well, it's a great starter item. Then it's also great barter items. You know, you've already bought it. You've already spent the money on it. You've upgraded your gear. You can always either buy, sell, and trade that stuff for better items. You can put it back as barter items, or like you were saying, you can bag it up and, and give it to some of your friends as a, a prepper starter kit. Right. Uh, you know, one of the things that we do, every one of our cars, we have a get home bag in it of my, my family. And, you know, we set it up, they have the bag. Uh, and sometimes, you know, you've got to put, a, there's a lot of expense in that mm-hmm. to put five bags together for us. So, uh, and then I do my mother-in-law and then my son's girlfriend, you know, and before long, (laughs) you know, you got a lot of backpacks. So sometimes you can't necessarily run out and buy something that's really expensive to put in there, but you can put something that'll get them by. Okay. We're going to come back to some more questions in a second. We're going to get on to um, relying on gear uh, rather than know-how. One thing that I've learned over the years is the shape of a knife blade is very important. Mm. Uh, you know, the, the thing is, is there are some knives that are thin and, and and very capable of doing certain things. Let's take a Swiss Army knife. Those are well known, very, has a great reputation. They're not for all things. Uh, and sometimes, you know, a knife with a really heavy spine that I can really do some batoning and chopping, the blade shape, the the actual angle, you know, the, the hollow ground or, you know, what whatever that it's uh, there are certain things that cut better and, and work better. So getting your gear out and finding out its limitations, everything has a limitation. Every, you know, serrated knives have been a, a mainstay for decades now you know, because they're, they're really sharp. They cut really well for sawing, but not necessarily for cutting operations. A lot of people buy knives that have a partially serrated edge on it. And then it's got, you know, a regular knife blade at the front. They're, those knives are more difficult to sharpen and you know, you've got the little serrated part at the very bottom, but you know, I'm, I'm not a fan of serrated knives for, for a EDC daily use knife. I like a straight edge on my knife, but I also like a more of a belly on my knife, like a drop point skinner. Yeah. Because it it's, I use a knife for cutting, you know, not, not necessarily as much for stabbing and poking. I use a knife for cutting a lot and uh, I want a blade shape for it's a tool the purpose that i use it for all the time especially for my edc and a a knife that has a a deep belly in it that cuts really well from the back all the way out to the point is uh is really important to me so you know blade shape i think is is really more important or at least as important as the the quality and the type of knife that you're buying but it's it's overwhelming 
I mean, there's so yep. many different shapes. There's so many different. I mean, you even have like, you know, your um, uh, cleaver types mm -hmm. and all this stuff. So this is the key is to take it out and to start cutting things. Uh, build you a fire, feather it, see how that works. Maybe doing some a little bit of batoning, which means you're taking the knife and you're taking a stick and you're doing this to split the wood. You can do even with a small knife like this. I can do it. It's just small pieces. But then also it's like fire kits. You know, you have your fire kit put together. It is <coughs> awesome. It is full. You've got everything you need. So you just go, OK, great. I got it. Go out and start a fire. Uh, we did that with our prepper group where we had a fire clinic and it's amazing how little people really knew. Mm -hmm. I went to a survival school with um, Fieldcraft Survival and we went and there was a 20 something people there. And it was amazing to me that people that had the mindset of survival went to the class, couldn't start a fire. Yeah. They didn't know their tools. Uh, so, you know, learning how to do that. You know, I did a video where uh, I went out into the rain. It had been raining for three days. And I said, we're going to build a fire in the rain. I did it. I, I had to do some research first because I wanted to make sure that I had some ideas. But you can build a fire in the rain with it pouring rain. Uh, you know, you have to take certain precautions. You have to cover it up so you can get it, you know, whatever. But until you do it, you may never be able to do it. Yeah. But they're just little secrets that when you get out to do it, that you go, oh, oh, that's cool. That's cool. Look how this does. Look how that does. Uh, so. Uh, getting your equipment out and training with it. Get a multi-tool. Don't just stick it in there. Take it out and use it. Take some bolts off. Do some things that you can. Do some repairs. And then put it in your pack. Don't put it in your pack when it's never even been used. You may pull it out and go, well, let me see what I can do here. Um, and then, you know, what training. Of course, firearms training is a big deal. Don't go buy your gun and your ammunition. Stick it back and go, okay, I got it. And not have the training you need. Uh, you know, with uh, medical, man, medical is like black magic. And yet, if you go to some trauma classes or Red Cross, you find out that really there's some principles. That That's right. Kind of, you know, it's like using a knife. You know, if if you've never used a knife for anything other than cutting meat and stuff in the kitchen, you you're not a knife person, but you're wanting to to become a knife person. You want to learn how to use a knife. You don't buy a knife and go out and, you know, start cutting limbs and carving and all this stuff. You start with a soft medium. You know, when I was in scouts, we used to start the, the younger boys off with a bar of soap and they would get their pocket knife and they would start carving a bar of soap because then they learn how to angle the blade to get thin shavings. They learn how to steepen the angle to get thicker shavings. They learn how to do radiuses and corners and carving, but it teaches them how to use a knife safely on a medium that cuts relatively easy. So they're not cutting themselves while they're, while they're learning. But you know, just a, just a tip for you. You know, if you're, if you're not a knife person, you're wanting to learn how to use a knife and how to use one properly, get you a bar of soap and start carving on a bar of soap. And you'll learn really quickly how to change the angle of the blade to get what you want out of it. That's really good. That was worth you coming today. That's what I'm here for. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So know-how <clears throat> is more important than the gear. Mm -hmm. um, again, Profal took a Rambo survival knife and used it throughout, you know, the ordeal he went through. So, but having good gear makes it and good know-how really makes a pinnacle where you're really being able to be as effective as you can. Okay. Number eight is buying up prepackaged food. Not dissing prepackaged food. There's some good stuff out there. Yep. yep. But don't <clears throat> go buy a big can tote, a tote or a <laughs> container of prepackaged food until you have tried it, until you have tested it to see if it's okay, if it tastes good, the ease of, of making it into a meal. But more importantly, a lot of times the nutrition, it'll say this produces 1,500 calories. But are the calories, how much protein is in it? how much of it is carbs yep. and how much of it is salt, just salt. And so you need to find the right ones. The problem with most prepackaged food, if it's really good, is it's expensive. That's right. Mountain House makes good, good products. Backpackers Pantry. There's a number of different ones. I mean, we bought some of the uh, Patriot Supply mm -hmm. and uh, it seemed to be pretty good. And so, you know, we can buy it in totes. Speaking of totes, I didn't want to diss them because that's, but, you know, I went also to Sam's and got a container of this 
survival food, you know, yeah. and went and tried it out. And it was like, good gosh, the salt content in that thing <laughs> that took my head off. But again, it's really important to remember that it's not just calories. Uh, the calories are important, but you've also got to think about your, where they're coming from. Right. And, yep. and the other elements to make it a balanced nutrition. Uh, and and uh, the other thing, too, is, guys, is don't just depend on that. So one thing that we do, we we buy prepackaged food. We, we went and then we went to the Mormon cannery and bought a ton of food when they were opened up to the public, which they do on occasion. Uh, you can really get some good quality natural food uh, that you're going to have to prepare. But it's uh, it's all natural. It's good, good stuff. But we buy and I've said this a number of times we bought we buy a lot of canned food, yep. uh, things that we're already eating or things that we've had in the past. One thing that we did was we went out and bought a bunch of Denny Moore beef stew mm -hmm. and we put it back. And then what we did was we pulled it out and we had it for dinner one night and we we're like, this isn't bad. That's right. I mean, it's not it's not <clears throat> Papa's pork roast or anything, <laughs> but it was pretty, de pretty dang good. And so making sure that you're incorporating those kind of things in your diet, because what happens is just like Southern Prepper found out Southern Prepper, great chance. Southern Prepper one buddy of mine, Dave, uh, he lives not too far from me. And he did an, a test one time where he took all the food that he had a year supply of, and he tried to live on it. He said, this is all I'm going to eat. And after about three or four days, he couldn't eat. Mm -hmm. He just couldn't eat it. And he said, I've got a lot of work to do. And he goes, I'm losing energy. He said, but I just have no appetite for this food. So be careful not just to buy up a bunch of prepackaged, you know, survival food, put it back and sit back and go, okay, we're yep. done. Well, you know, it's like when you, when you travel, a lot of times when you travel, you eat things that you don't normally eat at home. Hmm. And it ends up causing a lot of uh, gastric issues. Yeah. <laughs> So, you know, TMI, <laughs> I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm just, playing. just being realistic, you know, it, it causes gastric issues and your, your preps are exactly the same way. If it's not something that you eat on a regular basis, it can cause some pretty severe gastric issues. Uh, whether it's canned foods, whether it is freeze dried foods, your prepackaged foods, MREs, which you've experienced. Absolutely. That. Uh, anyone that's been in the military has experienced gastric issues from MREs. <laughs> okay. It's called plugging. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, why do they give you the, the little chiclet, you know, uh, gum that comes with it that's, uh, you know, a, a laxative? Uh -huh. it's because the, the MREs will impact you if you're not careful. <laughs> so, you know, you have to drink plenty of water. Any of this, any of your prepackaged food, you're going to have to drink a lot of water with that because it, it's a lot of it is freeze dried foods. You have to drink water with it or you're going to you're going to end up with some severe stomach issues. Um, so make sure you're eating this stuff and make sure that your body likes it before you buy a bunch of it. Right. Right. And you're right. Um Okay. Number nine, just being unorganized, just being, just buying it up and putting it back. And that's on my checklist, my checklist. You got to have a plan. You got to have a plan. Yeah. Um, you know, no plan, no rotation of food. Uh, one thing we did uh, when my wife really first uh, set up our prep room mm -hmm. and, you know, she was buying stuff and putting it in. We were more concerned about where to put it and how to organize it as far as shelving and what would help. We even had a shelf to collapse because the cans weighed so much. Uh, and so then we went through after a while and started looking at dates. And it was like, whoa, this is getting close to time. So, you know, we started organizing our food for rotation. Yep. First in, first out. Right. The first thing you buy is the first thing you eat. And then you have the some things over here and over here that are on another schedule. So right. you need just to watch because you don't want to be wasteful, but you want things actually that will last. One of the great things about canned food is that it really has no expiration. It has a best buy date because people just do it. But canned food typically will last for a hundred years. Yep because of the processes and the heat and the sanitary conditions, the lining uh, and the cans. Right. I mean, it's, that's to me, that's one thing we've kind of gone heavy on. We have all the other, but we've gone kind of heavy on toward canned food mm -hmm. uh, and to it's a little bit more stable and you can just open it needed if you wanted to. But um, 
making sure that the nutrition setup is good. Again, making sure that you have the proteins and, and the different things that you need. Uh, then it goes to uh, being or unorganized is not knowing where your gear is. You get your gear, you get it piled in a corner. This is the camping gear. This is the tactical gear. This is, you know, my tools. And before long, you're very unorganized. You need something and you can't find it. Uh, so, in a grid down situation, you don't want to be searching for something that is vital and you may not know where it is. Well, you know, after you've been prepping for several years, you you realize that, man, I've got a lot of stuff and having it organized. You, you have to. You just have to. You know, right. We, we put everything in these big black totes. We, we got them from Lowe's, black tote, yellow lid. I don't know what they're called. Storage. Totes, We've got whatever. those too. They, they just work so well. They you know? do. But we. We put a laminated label on the front of every one of those totes that has a list of everything that's in that tote. If it's if it's outdoor supplies, it'll have or, or camping or whatever. It's got a big tag on it that says camping. And then on the front of it, there's a laminated label that lists everything that's in that tote. It, just because we do have a lot of preps and that's an easy way that we've found that we can label and identify and make things uh, easy to find and get to. Right. Sometimes and, and I know you just, do, you do the same thing oh, with yeah. a lot of your stuff. Yeah. Even uh, by the big rolling toolboxes yep. and we have things labeled out on prepping supplies that we need. And um, a lot of that has to do with what I do because we do a lot of different reviews, yep. but it kind of keeps things in one area. There's nothing worse for me years ago than having a, putting together a bug out bag to show. And then when it's done, sometimes I would take it out. Sometimes I wouldn't. Sometimes I just take out a couple of pieces and it had these three or four bags that were bug out bags that were incomplete. Mm -hmm. And then when I needed something, I couldn't find it. Yep. And so I just started organizing my stuff to where I could keep up with it. It's very important to keep organized. Also maintenance and repair on things. Uh, one of the things we did, uh, I did a few years ago was taking your bag, your go bag, and going through it, looking for any tears, looking for anything that could be wrong with it, a buckle mm -hmm. getting weak. Uh, then taking your flashlights, checking your batteries. Yep. Uh, all of a sudden you see you've got AA batteries and they corroded the internals and the flashlights absolutely worthless or even a night piece of night vision, which that happened to me one time. But going through and making sure that you're maintaining what you have and repairing it and keeping it up to date. Here's the thing. You don't want to grab your bag in an emergency and get out and find vital items like your Bic lighter. Uh, and that's all you got. And then it just won't light mm -hmm. because the, the wheels corroded or there's no fuel in it uh, because it's all evaporated. And little things like that can get out of hand, making sure your knives are staying sharpened. Learn how to sharpen a knife. But that's mm -hmm. another story. Um, <laughs> okay. So organize, get organized, rotate, repair. Um, you're too focused on bugging out. This is number 10. You're just too focused. It's like, I got my bug out bag. I know my place I'm going. I'm set. And, you know, you have your stuff together. Uh, that used to be kind of the big deal is yep. you needed a bug out bag and anything else was, was whatever. Bugging out is a glorified refugee. Do not put all of your preps, unless you live in a city, if you live in a major metropolitan area that right now is close to SHTF because mm. of the crime rate. You're living there and something really goes down big. You need to get out. I will give you that. Get the heck out. Uh, unless you have a really solid community around you that can join together and, and be solid. But that's not typical for most cities. Uh, but get to, and I'm not talking about out to the mountains and to live off the land because that's a pipe dream unless you're a Navy SEAL and even then, uh, you know, you're going to have, a, or, a, you know, U S army ranger or whatever you're still, you're not going to want to live out there. Uh, so have your, have yourself plan, but don't base all of your preps on your bug out bag and bugging out, base it on bugging in, stay in because that's where your supplies are. That's where your resources are. That's where your neighbors that, you know, some you like, some you don't, but that's where they are. And also your friends and family and relatives also know where you live. Uh, so you want to make sure that you really plan for the bugging in. Have a bug out bag. Have a bug out plan. Make sure that you have that because you, you may have to evacuate. It may, you may not have a choice. And it should be that way before you bug out. 
you're just pretty much like, I don't have a choice. That's right. <clears throat> it's bug out and evacuation are kind of a universal term. Yeah. You know, if you, if you're going to have to do one, you're going to have to do the other. And, uh, but you know, when it, when it comes to bugging out, a great example of people that bugged out are the first Europeans that came to the United States. They bugged out of Europe to come to the United States for a better life. That's right? true. They packed up a ship with some people and some supplies. They came to the United States and the vast majority of them starved to death because they didn't have the resources to be able to survive in an environment that they were unfamiliar with. All right. Or the Dahmer party, even right. worse. That's right. That's right. <laughs> but yes, that's a, that's a great point. So bunker in should be your primary. Bugging out is important, but it's secondary. Yeah. Okay. Tactical. Going tactical. Going tactical. Getting all your your camo and your plate carriers and you, you know your battle rifles and forty seven magazines and just being head to toe, head to toe. Nothing wrong with any of that. You need to be able to defend your property, but if you're too busy getting all the latest and greatest and you got this and you got that and you're, you're all set up in a normal grid down situation, and I'm just, you know, there is no normal grid down, uh, <laughs> but typically with the way things have gone around the world, being decked out uh, to fight off a zombie apocalypse 24 seven is just not reality. Uh, there can be, if you're on a security team and you're watching a group, it can be important to have those things. And and I think you should have them, uh, some of those things. But I think don't get too just focused on being tactical, walking around with camouflage on and your plate carriers <clears throat> and standing out like a sore thumb. Exactly. Yeah. You know, it's very easy to go heavy on the tactical side and neglect a lot of your other preps. And I think a lot of people that initially get into prepping, they get into the tactical, the tactical side of it very early and very heavy and neglect a lot of the other major, really important preps. Right. Like water. Yeah. You know, or like, um, you know, it was funny though. I, we, I knew a, well, a buddy of mine that was in law enforcement. He told me one time, this girl had a restraining order against her husband because he had threatened to kill her. And so one night she was at home and all of a sudden the door the guy kicked the door in and he's standing there with a plate carrier. He had guns, he had magazines, he had his rifle, he, he had knives and he was just going to kill her. And he kicked the door in and he stood there and she took a 22 pistol and went boop, right between the eyes, dropped him dead like that. Having all that gear and everything else can be useful, but don't use it when it's not necessary. Uh, I, we've got it. We're, we're all about it. We think, you know, that it's a smart way to go to yep. have that in case something goes wrong. We're and not the tactics dissing it. And the training to go along with it. LARPing. You know what? If you've never been in the military, so what? You are a U.S. citizen and we have the right as a militia, uh, you know, and of course, you know, the gov they tried to twist all that up. But really, each of us have to defend our own freedoms. So no disrespect to that. I think it's important to do. And I think you need to train and you need to go out. You need to understand your gear. But don't just go... Oh man, I got to have that new thermal imaging scope and you don't have any food. Easy. It's focusing. I'm getting close to my feels now. Well, I like <laughs> thermal too. I like thermal. I love thermal. Okay. Last but not least uh, is lone wolf. Mm. So a lot of guys, you know, you kind of go, it's my stuff. I've been buying this up. I'm protecting me and my family. This is my area. If you come around me, I'm going to gun you down or I'm going to turn you away at gunpoint. Understand, believe me, uh, you know, I, for years I've had people to say, well, if something happens, I know where I'm going. You know, <laughs> you hear that a lot. But here's the fact. By yourself, you cannot be total security 24-7. Yep. Just that. Just that alone. Much less all the work that goes into, in a grid down situation, just surviving. You know, the old saying, it takes a village is really, really true in a grid down situation. It's probably the only thing that Hillary Clinton ever said that was true. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but he's right. I mean, that was the one thing that for foul during the, the modern survival guide for economic collapse during the economic collapse said that the reason we survived is we joined together. Mm -hmm. A lot of people had cabins way up in the mountains. And when things started going south, they took off up to their cabins. 
and the gangs and cartels followed them up there and killed them and took their stuff. So big thing is Lone Wolf is not survivable, to be honest. Uh, you need to make sure you have a team, a group, even if it's one or two. Even in the Bible, it says that one person alone is very vulnerable. Two uh, can come together and strive against one or three makes a strong cord. So taking that and, and building on it, yep. Uh, we have a prepper group, and that's one thing that you have to be careful when you're doing. But there are typically, if you go to your Facebook page, we have an upstate preppers group here in, in the upstate of South Carolina. And they meet, and you get to know people, and you know you can uh, establish relationships, you can build networks, you can do things. So uh, a lot of times going to your local gun shops, and you're hanging around, talking to a lot of those guys because they are self-defense-minded. They're prepper minded, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and so find it going to church. Church is probably one of the best. I think so, um, too, because you find some people <clears throat> there that you can really build some relationships with. You have a lot in common and you can work together. So Lone Wolf and, uh, you know, it's funny. I had a guy tell me one time, he says, well, I'm Lone Wolf and that's just crazy. And I can do this, that and this and that. And I said, you are one of point nine, nine, nine percent of the people on the planet, because most people have to have others for socially. Uh, for different things you're doing, but security wise, definitely. And a lot of other things is to build that team. So 12 items and there are more, there are more, but these are the 12 that we felt were the most important. I really appreciate Robbie Wheaton for being here. And again, check out Wheaton Arms. He's the official supplier of all the dagger upgrades for Palmetto State Armory. Uh, but he makes incredible block aftermarket parts, including the flat face trigger, which is my all time favorite. Uh, and also barrels. If you're looking for a threaded barrel, you have a suppressor you want to put on there or different things. And also Wheaton Arms. Yep. yep. Our Wheaton Arms with our uh, custom shop. Make sure you check out our custom shop if you need any kind of gunsmithing or custom work done to any of your firearms that you already have. A lot of you have all the guns you need. You just want to upgrade it. RMR cuts, barrel threading. We take care of all of that for you. And then make sure you check out our uh, YouTube live tonight. From 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. It's a Robbie Wheaton YouTube channel. Look forward to seeing you there. And the link's down below in the description. We also appreciate Sarah Mack for asking the questions. Uh, we didn't get a break. We only got one break today, which we try to have a couple, but we had this was a very important list. Also, remember Exotac. You need a fire kit, and they have the tools, and you get 20% off using Such20. Hit the link down below in the description. Thanks for being here. We really appreciate you guys. Guys, the main thing right now is, even if you're new, is just to, whatever you do today is going to put you ahead of where you were yesterday. So just take, just strive to add a little bit of preps. And if you're doing it smart uh, before long, you know, you're going to be in good shape. So be strong, be of good courage. God bless America. Long live the Republic.